So I want to introduce Brendan Bentz, who's an assistant professor of religion at William Jewell College, and he's going to take us back to the Amarna period. So the talk is In Search of Israel's Insider Status, a Reevaluation of Israel's Origins. Ancient Israel is famously known for being set apart from among the nations, representing a unique social and political entity in the ancient Did world. You your slides? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, just, just yeah. a little more. Oh, a little bit more here. Okay. There are several biblical traditions that have contributed to this identity. First and foremost, the Israelites are regarded as a monotheistic community called to worship the God who delivered them from Egypt and, provi and who provided them with a code of social ethics that countered the oppression they faced there. United by a shared tribal identity, a bucolic way of life, and a common experience of an exodus from Egypt, Israel was prepared to establish an egalitarian community in the Southern Levant that stood in direct opposition to the hierarchical, urban-centered polities of their polytheistic, Canaanite counterparts who originally inhabited the land. In spite of the overwhelming number of biblical claims to the contrary, most modern scholars do not hesitate to affirm the points of continuity between the so-called Canaanite religion and Israelite religion, concluding that they developed out of the same cosmic pool. The question remains, however, as to whether or not there are points of continuity between social and political structures of the late Bronze Age Levantine populations and those of the constituents of Israel. If there are, it seems likely that at least part of early Israel stemmed from the same socio-political pool as well. While the parallel seems a bit straightforward, pursuing a solution to this question is complicated. In addition to the influence that the Exodus and other biblical traditions have on shaping our perception of Israel's social and political character, there are several traditions deeply embedded in the history of thought that impact our understanding of the social and political character of the ancient Near East in general. For example, modern appraisals of the ancient Near East polities are influenced by Herodotus' uh, evaluation of the Persian Wars, which he casts as a conflict between Greek democracy and Oriental despotism. The earlier Sumerian and Akkadian literary traditions often drew a sharp contrast between the pastoralists of the steppe and the culturally advanced societies of urban-centered populations. While Michael Roten mitigated this distinction by pointing out that it reflects the biases of the urban populations from which these traditions stemmed, scholarship largely continues to regard these two categories of people as opposing sectors of society that remained politically distinct. Though the ancient data provides a unique window into the social and political landscape of the Levant during the Late Bronze Age, these longstanding assumptions, both biblical and non-biblical, have directly influenced the way scholarship has interpreted the evidence. Most descriptions are characterized by several critical dichotomies, including sedentary versus non-sedentary, state versus tribe, and hierarchical versus egalitarian. Ultimately, these dichotomies support and are supported by the later biblical tradition that sets Israel in opposition to Canaan and have resulted in the common belief that early Israel originally consisted of a group of geographical, economic, and or political outsiders. While I believe these models contribute to our understanding of some of the groups that were later defined or associated with Israel, the Amarna letters indicate that the standard expectations of a sharp cultural and political contrast between the late Bronze Age Canaan and early Israel are perhaps overrated. In what follows, follows, I will focus on three phenomena attested in these letters. They include collective governance, the prominence of a cooperative political structure that consists of independent political units, and the integration of populations that are not identified with a settled center with urban-centered polities. When compared with the biblical depictions of Israel's formative stages, these phenomena suggest an alternative picture of the origin and nature of early Israel that has both historical and social, if not theological, implications. 
And while archaeology plays a very important role in this evaluation, I have chosen to focus on texts for this presentation because they contain direct accounts of the socio-political dynamics that occurred on the ground, that bearing witness to, identifying and describing in relatively consistent terms the various entities, categories of people and players involved. In this way, they provide an interpretive framework for the critical information derived from the archeological record, which in turn, I believe can help us disentangle some of the nuances of the biblical text. So I begin with collective governance. Scholarship generally recognizes that two political, distinct political units dominated the landscape of the late Bronze Age Levant. The first was the city, Akkadian Alu, which is marked by the determinative Uru. It consisted of a single urban center and its immediate hinterland. The second, which is marked by the determinative Kur, is what I refer to as a centralized Matu, or land. As with cities, centralized lands were administered from a single urban center from which they generally derived their names. However, the authority of a centralized land extended beyond its royal center and immediate hinterland to include other cities. In other words, they were politically integrated units that consisted of multiple dependent populations. In general, both of these polity types are regarded as having been hierarchically administered by a small proportion of the political elite over and against the large sedentary populations in a manner comparable to medieval feudalism or an Asiatic mode of production. This reconstruction has been used to support three models of Israel's origins that dominate the field. As geographical outsiders, some of whom may have fled from Egypt, it was into this dominant Canaanite structure that the Israelites entered. As economic outsiders, it was out of this dominant structure through the process of peasant revolutions and flight into the hill country that the Israelites emerged. As political outsiders, it was next to this dominant structure through a large scale sediment process in the central highlands that Israel took shape. In each case, it was against this structure that Israel ultimately defined itself. While the political will of cities and centralized lands was often identified with and articulated by their individual leaders in the Amarna letters, there are instances in which the citizens and or representative decision-making bodies of a city or centralized land take collective political action. Though they are often overlooked, these examples reflect the nature of social power as articulated by several anthropologists, sociologists, and historians. As Edward Lehman and Anthony Giddens and Michael Mann have pointed out, rather than being a purely hierarchical phenomenon, power is administered through multiple social spheres and resources, making it available to multiple social players. In this way, the administration of power is best understood as a dialectical process, consisting of what Michael Blanton and his colleagues referred to as both exclusionary and corporate forms. One of the most striking examples of this revolves around a category of people attested in the letters from Gubla referred to as the Hupshu. The universal or near universal translation of this term as peasant or serf indicates that scholars regard the Hupshu as politically disempowered group of economically depressed rural denizens. A nuanced reading of their status informed by the aforementioned understanding of power, however, demonstrates that they were an economically viable, urban-centered group who played a significant role in the political scene at Gubla. Their corporate activities are specifically demonstrated in their decision to reject their leader and banish him from their city. Rivadu details the events that led to his exile in EA 138. According to his testimony, the consistent or constant assault that his city faced from Aziru had depleted the resources of the Gublites, a category that included the Hupshu. In an attempt to alter the situation, the Gublites moved against Rivadu with the result that a number of them died at his hands. This act of force appears to have quelled their rebellion temporarily, affording Rivadu the time to dispatch yet another request for military support to Egypt. However, the failure of the Egyptians to respond led the Gublites to proclaim, abandon him, that is, the king of Egypt. Let us align with Aziru. Again, Rivadu rejected their demands and set off to Beirut to form a military alliance with Amunira. In his absence, Ribadu's brother took the opportunity to capitalize on the frustration and the fatigue of the Gublites. According to Ribadu, he spoke and swore to the city with the result that the lords of the city rejected Ribadu and his authority 
and align themselves with the sons of Abdi Ashirta. A second example of corporate political activity in the Amarna letters responds to the popular claim that only a ruler of a vassal state could correspond with the Egyptian king. While this activity required political authority and legitimate representation to occur, the data indicate that it was not limited to exclusionary forms of power. With the rejection and exile of Rivadu, EA 138, uh, 139 and 140 introduce a new mode of political discourse at Gubla. Rather than being officially represented by a single individual, the political voice of this polity is articulated by a certain Ili Rapich and the city Gubla. According to Professor Artsy, this joint leadership means a, to us a reestablishment at Gubla of the ancient city organization. However, this assertion is an overestimation. The letters from Gubla indicate that corporate and exclusionary power political strategies could coexist throughout the Amarna period and at times struggled against one another. There are two other examples of the citizens of a city communicating with their Egyptian overlord. In their introductory greeting of EA 59, the correspondents address the king of the land of Egypt, our lord, referring to themselves as the sons of Tunip, your servants. Similarly, the only extant letter from Irkata, EA 100, is identified as the tablet of Irkata, which contains the message of Irkata and its elders. As with the lords of Gubla and the sons of Tunip, Irkata's body of elders represented the political voice of the city in general. And I provided a larger excerpt from EA 100 because it articulates a variety of political roles undertaken by the elders of Irkata. A final example of corporate political activity is reflected in the various ways in which the citizens of a city form political alliances with other independent political units. These alliances took several forms, including intercity alliances, alliances between the citizens of a city and individual leaders, and alliances between the citizens of a city and the Apiru. In addition to the alliance forged between the Gublites and Aziru highlighted above, one of the most striking cases is found in a letter from Abdi Khepa, the ruler of Jerusalem. In EA 290, he informs his Egyptian overlord that the citizens of the city Bit Ninurta seceded from his centralized land and forged a political alliance with the citizens of Kiltu. These examples indicate that there was a wide spectrum of political representation in the Levant during the Amarna age. One end of the spectrum was occupied by entities that were represented by the political voice and actions of their respective leaders alone. At the other end were those that took corporate political action in the absence of a single leader. There are also examples of political entities falling somewhere in the middle where exclusionary and corporate forms of power coexisted. In the end, the so-called Canaanites of the Amarna age did not solely reflect a hierarchical political organization that stood in opposition to the egalitarian structure of Israel. Rather, the power dynamics involved reflect Blanton's definition of an egalitarian social structure, which, quote, does not imply an absence of hierarchical control but any behavior that aims to establish and uphold restrictions on the exercise of exclusionary power, whatever its social setting in simpler or more complex societies. Move to multipolity decentralized lands. Political organization in the late Bronze Age Levant is a complex matter that resists conceptualization even by the ancient Scrabble tradition. This is illustrated in the different polity types to which the determinative core could refer. In addition to centralized lands, there's a second polity type that takes this determinative, which I refer to as multi-polity decentralized lands. As opposed to a centralized land, which was a discrete political unit under the authority of a single leader who governed his domain from a central administrative hub, this type of land was comprised of a political coalition of cities and centralized lands that retained their local independence and identities under the authority of their uh, respective leaders and or collective representative bodies. In the historical introduction to the Hittite Treaty between Murshili II of Hatti and Tupi Teshup of Amuru, Murshili recalls the time when Tepi Tushup's grandfather, Aziru, came to the aid of the Hittites when the kings of the land of Nuhashi became hostile. The conflict between the affiliate members of this multi-polity decentralized Matu and Aziru is reflected in several letters recovered from Amarna. Depicted as an alliance of independent kings, 
cooperated in cooperation with one another against the common enemy, Azira informed the Egyptian overlord on several occasions that the kings of Nuhashi were at war with him. The corporate activities of the kings of the land of Nuhashi are paralleled by those, paralleled by those of the constituent leaders of the land of Gina. According to Professor Naaman, rather than representing a single polity or city, the land of Gina referred to the entire Jezreel Valley during the 18th dynasty in Egypt. He goes on to argue that Megiddo and Tachnaka were two of the most prominent cities located within the region. In EA 245, Biridia, the Khazanu of Megiddo, and Yashdatu, the Khazanu of Tachnaka, are listed as allied leaders of a coalition of cities that took up arms against Labayu. In EA 250, this coalition is specifically referred to as the Land of Gina, indicating that it was not simply a geographical reference, but a political body that could take collective military action. The list of affiliate members is expanded in EA 250 to include Shunama, Burkuna, Harabu, and Giti Riminuima. Though the authors of the Amarna letters were often consumed by military concerns, the activities of the constituent leaders of a multipolity decentralized land did not always revolve around such matters. Returning to the land of Gina in EA 365, Beridia of Megiddo complains that he alone had furnished the necessary labor force to cultivate the lands around Shunama, accusing the other leaders of not doing the same. This accusation suggests that as members of the land of Gina, these leaders were expected to reciprocate. If this is the case, multipolity decentralized lands did not exist solely for mutual protection against a common enemy, but for other non-martial activities such as agricultural production. Admittedly, the Amarna letters provide a relatively limited view of the Levantine political landscape during the Late Bronze Age. However, this has its benefits. The brevity of the period represented highlights the fact that the political affiliation identity was characterized by a high degree of variability that calls into question any attempt to explain group identity on the basis of ethnicity. As we have already witnessed, though the citizens of Bit Nyanurta originally identified themselves as members of the centralized land administered from Jerusalem, in the face of increasing hostilities that threatened their own immediate interests, they appealed to their local identity as citizens of Bit Nyanurta, at the expense of their identity as Jerusalemites. In addition, the members of the land of Gina appear to have had the freedom to choose whether they would participate in the coalition or not. The complexity of the Late Bronze Age political landscape increases when we consider the role of populations that are not identified with an urban center. Following Roten's dimorphic model of ancient society, scholarship often casts these populations as political outsiders. And there are two groups attested in the Marna letters that fall into this category, the Apiru and the Sutu. Recently, Daniel Fleming has called into question this tendency to regard the Apiru as disenfranchised urban dwellers who tip to the hills as brigands and mercenaries in order to escape their former creditors and or overlords. Pointing to the association between the Apiru and Abdiashirta, Labayu, and Biryawaza of Damascus, Fleming contends that they, quote, have something in common with the Khana of Zimri Lim and the Binu Sama, a population named by its mobile potential and yet carrying on the identity of a whole city-based kingdom. If one accepts this reconstruction, the Apiru represent a population involved in what Ann Porter calls broad-range herding that was fully integrated into polities that were administered from a settled center. A similar line of thought could be used to explain the role of the Sutians. Most contend that the Sutians represent a pastoralist nomadic element in Canaanite society. Living on the fringes of settled society, the Sutians fell outside the hegemony of urban centered polities. According to the Amarna letters, however, the Sutians could be affiliated with urban centered polities. For example, in EA 195, Biryawaza of Damascus lists the Sutu, whom he identifies as mine, among several groups that are appeared that are prepared to fight on behalf of Egypt's interests. In a context where Bir Yawaza also referred to my troops, my chariots, and my brothers, he seems to be including the Sutians as part of his domain or functioning within his domain in support of it. The Sutu are also named an important element as an important element of a zero's base of power in EA 169, 
a letter dispatched by Aziru's son while Aziru himself was in Egypt. In Aziru's absence, the kings of Nuhashi begin threatening hostilities against his son, perhaps seeing the lack of fortitude on the part of Aziru's temporary replacement. In the face of these threats, he reports that all of the lands and all of the troops of the Sutu said to me, Aziru is not coming forth from Egypt. This position, or this position was likely based on the belief that Aziru had been deemed unfaithful by his Egyptian overlord and met his fate while there. Because of this, the Sutu threatened to depart, to flee from the land of Amuru. This notice indicates that the Sutu continued or constituted an important role of Aziru's authority, whose cooperation and participation had to be negotiated. A situation reminiscent of the political structure at Mari and the events that took place between Rehoboam and the assembly of Israel at Shechem in 1 Kings 12. In this way, it seems that neither the Apiru nor the Situ should be regarded simply as stateless or disruptive elements of society. I turn to the Bible. It's my hope that the evidence presented will give us fresh eyes for viewing some of the biblical depictions of early Israel in new ways. Many have questioned the validity of using the Bible for reconstructing the early history of Israel. This is largely based on the contention that it reflects the ideological and or theological concerns of exilic and post-exilic Judean authors, editors, and redactors. In many cases, this assessment is correct. There are, however, several striking points of continuity between some of the biblical accounts of Israel's formative stages and the socio-political landscape of the Late Bronze Age that are so foreign to what the Bible as a whole promotes regarding the pre-monarchic period that they suggest an alternative political reality. These parallels call into question the notion that Judean scribes who were removed temporally, ideologically, and geographically from Israel fabricated them. When it comes to the Bible's vision of Israel in general, Judges 5 and Judges 9 are unusual. The Song of Deborah identifies several populations with Israel. This is not uncommon to the biblical depiction of Israel as a whole. However, the nature of Israel's constituents is unique. While the roster includes many well-known groups, it excludes Judah and Manasseh and introduces a unit referred to as Machir. In addition, it indicates that a city, Meroz, was also expected to participate in the coalition. Finally, the list is not limited to the constituents who participated in the coalition, but also includes those who chose not to as well. The depiction of Israel in Judges 5 closely corresponds to the nature of a multi-polity decentralized land in the Amarna age. As was the case with the members of the land of Gina, the constituents of Israel had the autonomy to choose whether or not they would participate in the collective. It is difficult to know why Moroz is the only member who is cursed by Yahweh for not responding to the call. Perhaps it is because she is not remembered in the Bible's later rendition of Israel's early history. Nevertheless, her decision to transfer her allegiance and a tense political situation calls to mind the decision of the citizens of Bit Ninurta, who, in the face of an external threat, seceded from the land of Jerusalem and aligned themselves with the citizens of Kiltu. The idea that Israel corresponds to a multipolity decentralized Matu of the Amarna age sheds light on some of the oddities of Judges 9. Another text whose compositional history is intensely debated. It depicts a political entity identified with an important urban center that played host to corporate and exclusionary forms of power that cooperated with and struggled against one another. The core of this narrative opens with the lords of Shechem agreeing to underwrite Amibelech's bid for power. After his successful campaign, the lords of Shechem, together with all Bet Milo, ratify Avimelech's authority as king. Finally, in a manner reminiscent of the Gublites rejection of Rivadu in EA 138, Gaal, who appears to have operated at a distance from Shechem, only to return to the city for the festival at the temple of their god, convinces the Shechemites assembled with him to reject Avimelech's kingship. These unique details have led many to conclude that Judges 9 is a Canaanite rather than an Israelite narrative. As Professor Halpern points out, when compared to the opposition posed by the religious establishment with the formation of the Israelite monarchy under Saul, this contrary tradition is somewhat jarring, particularly during the supposedly pre-monarchical period of the Judges. However if, if, however, if the political structure of early Israel reflected that of a multi-polity decentralized land, which are attested in the Amarna letters, 
the idea of a monarchy within Israel before the establishment of the Israelite monarchy would not be out of place. In fact, several have suggested that Gideon and even Jephthah function in a similar capacity on a local level within the larger framework of the Israelite collective. In spite of the weight that the Bible's final form has on defining the identity of Israel, this brief survey of the evidence suggests that at least a portion of the early Israelites were heirs to the socio-political tradition of the late Bronze Age. While some may have been geographical outsiders who participated in the exodus from Egypt, and others may have been economic and or political outsiders, some of the constituents that came to be identified with Israel were geographical, economic, and political insiders. This conclusion offers a biblical counterbalance to an outsider identity that has been misappropriated and misused by members of faith communities and those hostile toward them. While the Bible clearly promotes caution when engaging the world, overemphasizing the outsider status of a community can lead to isolationism and even violence. Recognizing the Bible's claims regarding Israel's insider status compels us to take part in meaningful discussions of what it looks like to operate in the world in just and fruitful ways, and to recognize the context in which we are called to be outsiders and which we are called to be insiders. As is demonstrated, or as was demonstrated last night by Professor Osman, and in the competing of visions, who is, uh, visions of who is to be admitted to the Israelite assembly in Nehemiah 13 and Isaiah 60, this dynamic is reflected throughout the Bible. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I love the Amarna letters. Uh, we have some questions, Israel. Oh. <clears throat> yes, Israel Finkelstein. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting lecture. Uh, I must say that I support what m much of what uh, you have just said. I have a note regarding or a suggestion to uh, uh, turn the spotlight a little bit from the social side to the geopolitical side mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the Amarna letters and later. In fact, uh, what you see is still, if we turn to geopolitical situation, we still see a very interesting continuation from the late ones to the Iron One, to the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. Because all the examples that you brought, and I'm sure that you are aware of it, they all have to do with expanding polities from the highlands. In the beginning, you started with uh, uh, Aziru and Amuru and uh, the margins of the Kingdom of Azur, the expanding king Kingdom of Aziru, that is to say Tunip and Gubla and Irkata. Yeah. And then from there to Labayo and his sons and the situation in the Jezreel Valley. And then to Abdi Khipa and not only Bet Ninurta, because you can add to this uh, the stories of Kiltu, of Robutu, of Ayaluna, of Sura, of Sabuma, and so on and so forth. It's all the margin, the western margin of the kingdom of Abdi Khipa and the attempt of uh, Abdi Khipa to expand and establish some sort of a territorial polity as early as the late Bronze Age. And this, I think, is maybe, may also be reflected in the, in a way, possibly, here we have to be very careful, in the Song of the Bora. If we put the background of the Song of the Bora a little bit later, maybe uh, on the background of the events in the 10th century of the expansion of uh, the early kingdom of Israel, of the early polity of Israel from the northern part, from the Samaria highlands into the valley. So we get the same kind of story and the same kind of, uh, of, of uh, situation. So here, in fact, we have the same kind of continuation from the late Bronze Age to the Iron Age. I think that's right. I think that's right. I like that. And it's interesting, for, especially for Amuru, where you do have success in moving from this multi-party decentralized Matu on, during the tenure of Abdi Ashirta uh, to a centralized Matu under Aziru. And so even that transition into a monarchical so, and state. Also the attempts to uh, expand from the highlands into lowlands capitals yeah, yeah. and to move the capitals to the lowlands and right. by that really establish a real territorial polity which combines highlands and lowlands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is the background for the uh, expansion to Tunip, to, first of all to Yerkata and Sumo and, and then to and Tunip. Yes, exactly. And even Byblos, I think, uh, maybe. Thank you.
Tom Levy. Um, I enjoyed your lecture very much. I wonder if you could elaborate a little more about the connection between the Amarna letters as you portrayed it and the Exodus uh, narrative. Yeah, good question. I, I, let, let, him gi let him give it a shot. I guess that was the point, wasn't it? Darn it. Uh, okay, thanks. Well, um, the, the, the idea being the Amarna letters suggest uh, social political structures and geopolitical uh, dynamics that reflect what's being depicted in what are, could be early depictions of Israel. So all that to say is, as I said before, a, a group of Israel likely comes out of Egypt and brings these traditions with them. But uh, perhaps a larger contingent are these groups that are already embedded in the land. And they're not, and they're not social malcontents that sort of establish this egalitarian relationship with this new uh, people who have this new law of, 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 a, of a communal society, but people who are already embedded in there, embedded in the land. And so, so the, really, the, the Levant is one of the um, sources of what Israel becomes. Does that make sense? OK. Yes. Oh. Okay. Hey, Stephen. Hey, hey, Brendan. Uh, this is Steve Russell. I really liked your presentation. As you know, I think you're uh, hitting the nail on the head here. Uh, just one, one um, possible point of comparison that you could chase down. I think uh, Bruce Routledge's um, treatment of Iron Age Moab would be of interest to you. Uh, he analyzes the Mesha Stila, and basic, one of his basic arguments is that the, the town is a primary segmentary unit that uh, Mesha is bringing together to form this larger polity. Um, yeah. So I think if you read his work, you might find some points of similarity with what you're trying to do. That's helpful. Thank you. I will. Uh, Bernie Bato. I'm wondering if, um, as you develop your theories of polity and so forth, if you have um, tested them against other uh, corpuses of texts um, for which we have a, a large amount. For instance, going the opposite direction a little bit earlier from the Amarna period, say, to Mari or those areas in there where we have also this kind of a conflict. Um, is that part of your agenda? Or I know that's stretching an awful lot, but I'm wondering if you've that's done great. that. That's great. One of my advisors at NYU was Mark Smith, and mentors. He would always say that, or he would frequently say, the Old, the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible is the Baal cycle. <laughs> I would say that the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible for me is Dan Fleming's uh, Democracy's Ancient Ancestors. And so, yeah, I, I draw heavily on the work that Dan has done. And, uh, and heavily indebted to it. And actually, I'm pretty proud to claim that, so. But yeah, the, the parallels are, are, are very close, yes. In fact, he, Dan picks, uh, call, uh, mentions Nuhashe along with the several other polities as Matum alliances, kings. Uh, where I diverge is I think that you could have um, larger centralized Matus within these decentralized uh, Matus. Uh, but the, the conversation and the interaction between tribal population and uh, urban centers and city-based <coughs> kingdoms is also very important. Oh, this is my study. Can I get the lever? Oh, Thanks. Yeah, one more. One more. Should I jump in here? Oh, Bill Deaver, I wonder if you would expand a bit on your use of the term egalitarian for early Israel. As I understand it, uh, well, I, my use of it is informed by Roten's definition of it, where, and I think Roten is responding to a use of egalitarian, which assumes that there's no, there's not a high level of, of hierarchical structure. 
Now there's, there's heads of households and there's families, but you don't have this uh, established uh, kingship or monarchy. And where the way that Blanton is using it is, you can have that, but that doesn't also mean that it limits corporate forms of power as well. And so egalitarian is anytime you have strategies to limit the expression of exclusionary forms of power. It's interesting that Gottwald eventually gave it up for commutarian, the term he used. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brandon, so much. It was a terrific paper, and it sets the table beautifully for this afternoon. <laughs> Enjoy your lunch. Whenever I hear about the Amarna city of Tunip, I just hope we're having tunip <laughs> fish for lunch. <laughs>